Hi. I hope you're well fed. <laughs> you had a nice lunch, some coffee to keep you awake. It's, it's still a nice view. I was, you know, um, yesterday, the sun was shining and I was thinking, I had the opportunity to look out the window and enjoy a beautiful sight and I was so afraid of today um, that it was going to rain, but it's an awesome view of Hamburg. <laughs> <laughs> and in addition to the great view, I'm really, really sure we're going to get a really great talk. Um, it's going to be about the black holes in your projects where you sink your money without realizing it. And the speaker is the head of development at Tech Division and an agile coach. Please enjoy, Stefan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so should we pull down the blinds just now? It's fine, you look at me. Oh, that's fine, thank you. <laughs> uh, I I'm going to uh, give you a talk about uh, some very hidden thing that you don't realize that there is in whatever organization you're working in, especially if you deal with development and not only like software development, also product development. And um, my name is Stefan, and uh, I got a real, like, a real book with me. This is by Don Reinertsen. Who of you know Don Reinertsen? He's a great guy, and this is the principles of product development, flow. It's important for you. <laughs> and um, I want to talk to you about something that is called cues. And um, this is something the Kanban lean thing is aiming at. Um, and that is quite the opposite of cues, and that is flow. So if I don't have flow, I have cues. And I would like to ask you just to stand up shortly. Can I do that? And pile up right in the middle here. Just, just one after the other, just no order. Yeah, very good, very good. So <laughs> what I'm go going to do now is I will make you, nope. <laughs> One after the other, a very great NEOS developer, okay? It take, I, I've done that. Uh, well, I could make you a great Agile coach or Scrum Master if you want, yeah? Okay. Um, one after the other. It is going to take a week per person, and you'll have to stand there. Is that okay? A week about, you, you are going... No, no. Um, okay, Lou is okay. Sleep, standing. Giraffes can do that. Uh, yeah. Who wants to do that? Great offer. Not even in the front? Oh, well. <laughs> but that is a cue. And that is what you have everywhere in your organization. You can have a seat again. Um, and can you see that? I'm going to draw a bit, if you don't mind. Can you all see my flip chart? OK. This is what. Um, cues look like ordinarily in your organization, like we have some where, where the work comes in, then you might have some maybe back-end and front-end development or something else. Like This is just very simple, just to show you. So you have a queue here. Those are tickets. There might be many. Yeah. And you'll have another queue here. Maybe larger than the other, maybe not. But nevertheless, you have queues. And you have people working on it and putting it onto the next step of the process. And queues pile up between those work processes. And this is actually what they feel like. And uh, have you ever been like overworked? N never? Uh, you are most probably not overworked because of the work that you're cur currently at, but because of what still sits in your back and needs to be done. And this is a queue, and it's most annoying. Um, and queues, you know where the Kanban system comes from? 
originally uh, it is the Toyota production system. So they realized something some years ago and um, they realized that inventory is expensive. Having things on the shelf that are basically of no good value is expensive. And so are queues. This is your inventory. You just do not put any price tag on it. And uh, if you take anything out of my talk today, you, if you keep this in mind, you'll be safe. Because this is the most fundamental pr principle you can actually learn from all the Toyota production system. Watch the work, not the worker. Do not like load your people to full um, utilization to that they can't do anything else but what they're currently doing. But have a look at the work itself, not at the people doing the work so much. Yeah? Because what they learned at Toyota is that loading machines or people to full utilization doesn't do any good. It's watching your inventory and watching the flow of the work that goes through your organization. And you have that as well, just um, it is not visible. And this is why I am talking about cues, because they are mostly invisible. You don't see them. You maybe feel them, but you don't see them. And you most probably do not put any price tag on them. They are annoying. They are poorly managed. Nobody cares about them. They are expensive. They are your inventory. They produce longer cycle times. Do you all know what a cycle time is? That actually is the time something needs that comes in to your organization or whatever and needs to get done. Th this is very simple a cycle time. You can make it complicated, but that's what it is. And um, if you have shorter cycle times, you are going to have higher profits. And that's actually what you're doing in, uh, with the uh, real. You have shorter cycle times. You are faster in what you're doing. You are going to have more profits. And more profits mean more freedom. The reasons there are cues is the inactivity between the works, work times, like there are coordination meetings and huge concepts and basically just things lying around. You have phase gate processes, like you do something and then another phase gets your results and the next phase does something with it and so on. And um, we have a high variability. Um, I was just talking about like, oh yeah, we had actually last year three projects that were really safe and uh, in January uh, after like uh, New Year's, they were all gone. So you have practically a high variability and a low predictability. You don't know what comes in and when it comes in and how much it is. And queues lead to further queues. So th that's the traffic jam, jam principle. Like this, this is all the phantom traffic jams that arise. And the reason, wha one of the reason, uh, reasons for queues is that they are not managed, and that's why they keep existing. And uh, it has something to do with capacity over utilization. That is something uh, I'm going to uh, talk about in a bit. But um, in order to do something about queues, one thing is to make them visible, to see where they are, how they look like. And um, therefore, we should know which economic impact do they have. And the basic economic impact they have is delay. This is, I, I, I just read a figure of traffic jams cost up to 80 billion euros in Germany per year. Uh, I never lost money in a traffic jam, so that must be some hidden cost. And uh, this is also uh, in your context. So 
what does it actually cost and how do we calculate the cost of queues. And for that, I'm going to show you how capacity over utilization and queues relate. And uh, just from my experience, many agencies work at, they have to work at 100%. They have just to have everything completely utilized just in order to exist. So they seem to have no space left. There must be queues. Yeah, I mean uh, there or must be things piling up. Yeah. Otherwise it would be always delaying. Exactly. And but there are times when delay is just too high and just costs too much. You will always have delay. You can't take it off the equation, but you can improve it. But the rest is waiting. The rest is waiting on the shelf. Just, just by the fact that it doesn't have a priority. Don't, don't you have priorities in it? Yeah. Do Do you have things that are more important than others in queues? Mostly. So let's make it simple. Let's. Don't, yeah, maybe. A funnel. Yeah. Yeah. Might be. Um, Don Reinhardson's talking about queues, and that's what he means, actually. Um, just to um, have a short chart here, this is what you, wh most of, organizations calculate like, let's take a percentage of capacity utilization. And up here is zero, and here's 100, yeah? And actually, that's your cost in euro. So if people are just sitting around, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And if they are fully utilized, it doesn't cost you any money. So this is what organizations are um, aiming at, most of them, to load their organization, load their processes. But there's another, another factor in it which correlates to it. Let's just make it roughly like this. And this is the so-called cost of delay. So this is maybe your capacity cost. And this is your cost of delay. And this is at high... Uh, capacity utilization scenarios, this is going to be very high because things are getting slower, cycle times are getting longer, and you cannot do things, you lose things, you lose opportunities, and this is in this area, and this area is, for example, your uh, fire brigade, they have a very high cost of delay, you need them, you pay them money just to sit around and wait for the next fire, basically. Well, you don't send them off for uh, writing parking tickets or something. They just sit around, you pay them. You pay this amount just to have a very low cost of delay. But you can add them, and your actual cost somewhat looks like this. And um, so we got two things out of this little graph, and the one thing is U-curves, and um, as soon as you have to do with uh, trade-offs. So we have seen you cannot load your organization to full capacity util utilization, otherwise things get lost and things go very slow, and you can't have them sitting around. And you have another factor, this cost of delay, and um, important trade-offs tend to have those U-curves. And those U-curves have uh, some um, very interesting things 
it is you have a wide area of optimization. You don't ha have to, basically, the best thing you know is, well, somewhere here is a optimal optimum cost ratio. So this is the lowest cost possible if you take both of them. And um, you don't have to have the exact point. This is just an area. Nevertheless, you should somehow start to look in uh, like what does it cost in order to put it on the same scale at all. I mean, putting this in euros is something very tricky, but it can be done. And um, so you have this wide range and you have no exact accuracy that you need. And we're going to uh, see many of them. And the next thing, um, anyone knows what your batch size is currently? What batch sizes you're working with? One? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, this is something uh, coming from the Toyota production uh, system again, and people are not very aware of. But this is the one of the greatest benefits we got out of Scrum and Agile, because what they did actually is they went from a batch size of projects into smaller batches, which have l far less risk and everything. And even in development, if you have like continuous deployment scenarios, you have very small batch sizes that you transfer into uh, any system or any um, area. And again, we have a U-curve in batch sizes which pretty much looks the same. You have two things you can balance. And the one thing is your holding cost, which is pretty linear. This is, let's take it, items per batch. And again, euros. So this is linear holding cost, like what is your brain disk space you need if you still keep all this thing and don't deliver it to the next step or to your customer or to life or whatever. And um, merge conflicts that arise and um, missed profit that you have. And then you have transfer costs. Transfer costs usually like in production systems, you have uh, things that have to be moved from here to there. And if this is very long distances. This is very expensive and you need to reduce it. And but we again, we have transfer costs in our organizations and agencies and development organizations like communication. If you have to talk about each ticket that you have, this is transfer cost that makes it a bit longer. And maybe it's easier to talk about whole projects people were thinking, but information gets lost. So if you balance transfer cost, which is very high at low item sizes, so if you um, do like just imagine, just exaggerating. You have to um, explain every single line of code to the next station. This is very expensive. This might be lower than one. This is again not very exact. This is transfer, and this is holding cost. And again, you have a U-curve. And this is something you can influence very good. Um, you can reduce your transfer costs by, say, automated deployments, by agile frameworks, by a simple measurement like co-locating people sitting together in the same room that have to work together. This is a very simple thing to reduce transfer costs. Um, you have to be aware of batches, uh, because not always a batch size of one or a very, very low batch size is desirable. Maybe it's easier to test two or three tickets at once. You have to balance it. It's not always a very linear thing. And as I say, optimum doesn't equal one. And if you reduce your costs, I'm going to just show you that, your transfer costs, your overall costs will be reduced. And this is something you can actively do. And now I'm coming to the uh, this cost of delay thing. This is actually what Don Reinertsen is very famous for because he's been doing this for 20, 30 years now in large organizations all around the world. 
And uh, actually, it means cost of delay. What does it cost to postpone something for a number of days? If you don't do it now, but do it like next month or the month after, what does it cost you actually? And um, what is the economical profit impact? What uh, impact has it on your profit to delay it? And therefore, you need to know life cycle profits. And you have, again, to put things on the same scale. I'm, I'm Actually, I'm talking a lot about profits and in a uh, like open source scenario, but I'm not talking about maximizing like airlines do. Um, sometimes I feel like sitting in that plane cannot move and they have been maximizing their profit or um, otherwise I wouldn't feel like that. So I'm talking more or less about optimizing profits. Is that okay? <laughs> So just a rough example. Those are just very rough. He doesn't, Don Reinertsen doesn't give any actual uh, real-world example. He's, he's got some great videos online that he's talking ab about this cost of delay. Um, but if you have several uh, products and you have an expected life cycle profit, what they will bring you. So this comes from like um, the product development organizations. And you have probabilities, so you have one which might be okay or not, and the other one is a safe thing, and the third one is, well, let's see, it will go out good, but maybe not that many profits. And you will have a cost of delay like this per week in profits. And this is what you now can balance with. Just to transfer it to like, an agency, I tried that, I'm just still working on it to have a good number, but what is, uh, actually any way of roughly calculating it is better than guessing. By statistics, you will be off by a factor of 200%. It can be like any figure, if you ask your um, people working on the same project for the cost of delay, if you explain them, they're going to show you numbers. They differ from a very wide range. And um, just to have an analogy, if you have certain customers and they have been with you for a certain time and they have brought you some profit, and uh, what now if you have to stop one for four weeks? How can you balance it? How can you explain like management? This one has to wait now. You sometimes have those because your queues are arising for certain reasons. There is a high variability. And this might be the cost of delay per week that you have. And much more interesting it is, what if you have, you have your sales team out and they bring new projects, like um, you have like an average customer, you know, okay, the average customer brings me per year, 25,000 maybe, and with a probability of 70%, because you never know. And then you have someone who maybe made holidays from you and now is coming back because he likes you and you did better than the other agency and you know for sure he's going to pay and he's going to pay everything and nothing's going to go wrong, so this is pretty sure. And then you have this kind of intriguing new technology project and um, with high profits but very insecure and you balance it and you balance it against the others because maybe some customer has to wait and you ha can sh see well which of them can I take in now and is it really worth it and this is something you really can work with and it's not the only measure, but let's say this second customer here is very nice. It's a customer you love, you've always been working with, but still it's not that much profit. That might be a factor, but well, this is some calculation you can just start off with and have other factors in, but this is put them, puts them on the same scale. 
Now, another way to measure um, queues is the cycle time, of course. So this is just some something you get out of Jira I don't like very much, but some people may know. So measure like the time from order to eat. Uh, this is a main Kanban metric. This is if you do anything in Kanban, you most probably do measure your cycle times. But it's a lagging indicator. You only know afterwards what your cycle time was. It doesn't help you in predicting queues. What does is a so-called cumulative flow diagram. Does anyone know? I'm going to show you that. Um, it measures input versus output. And um, I show you why it is a leading indicator. So this is the time. And this is just number of anything, whatever it is that you're measuring. And you have an input and an output line. So this is actually over time how many, say, tickets you are outputting and how much is coming in. And what you know is at this, on this point of time, you know, this is your time in queue. This is how long it's going to take for them to go out. And you have another thing. This is the length of your queue, okay? This is how long your queue currently is. Currently, at this point in time. This is a leading indicator. It tells you now. So um, this is perfect for visualizing queues. I show you, I'm going to show you why. Say um, we are at an airport. I just had this. I was in Beijing, and um, there's an output queue. I was just for transfer, so I could uh, easily just observe it, and it didn't bother me because it was in the morning, and like. Five A380 were landing at the same time. So there's this plane arriving. And suddenly passengers are in there. So what we know now, our length of queue, uh, our, our, the time in queue is going to be like that, and the length of queue uh, nearly doubled. So you're going to wait uh, twice as long as you did before, or even more. This is what you can take out of it. And what you can r do to react now, this is visualizing cues. You can react. Just to put it in, in like uh, another scale, let's say this is not an airplane, but this is a project. OK? This is a project coming in. So this puts you into the same um, mindset, because what you have to do now is to react. There's a new project coming in, so either people are working longer, or you skip another project that you already have, or you have to switch or put teams together like you actually don't want to do, uh, but you have to react somehow, and this tells you that. And what you do, like, um, uh, I've been talking to Sven yesterday, and uh, he said, well, we actually don't have that problem because um, we always can, like, take a new customer. We uh, just throw out an old one. <laughs> That's what they do. Or what they also do, what I really like, is not do the whole project at once, but maybe small chunks. Maybe just small chunks for now. They can always do that very easily. and." Um, start off with the project. But you have to react somehow. And this is rather batch sizes. You can react by doing something to your output queue or to your input queue. Now, how to manage queues in general. What I have learned over the years is do not focus too much on the development part. There is much more to it. Your whole organization, uh, a, a very um, common area for queues is marketing and sales, for example. This is where they pile up and where all has to be very... Huh? 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. <laughs> but they they are most probably not aware of Kisman. Your your IT department might do Kanban, might be aware a bit of queues. Um, but the rest of the organization, the rest of your value stream, of everything that adds value to your project, whether that can be sales or not, sometimes they are, um, what is on your critical path, what actually really, really needs to be done to get some output out of it? Um, this, these are most probably the areas you have to look into. You can optimize batch sizes by things like Agile frameworks by being aware of batch sizes, of the um, existence of batches and batch sizes. Uh, you can um, train your people in DevOps and co-locate them wherever necessary. This just brings so much. And um, know your economic framework, um, like lifecycle profits, cost of delay. You just have to get into it and start working with it and make rough calculations and be aware of it. This is the uh, uh, not an easy part. And start measuring cues. And one thing you can do, there are, like we heard before, there, are go there will always be cues. No way around it. Somewhere the work has to stay. Say a project is arriving, somebody knows about those projects. And if we just have a little board again, and we have just a typical, like we have two, two very uh, typical things where you have expensive queues, is right before things go live, the area of, hey, we are done, what about you? About, hey, customer, have you already looked at this? This is an expensive queue because this is all done. You just have to hit the button and deploy it. But um, it's an expensive queue. And this you can manage by things like batch size reduction. You, maybe the problem is that you are not able to deploy so easily. Maybe that's a technical point. Maybe it is a thing like cadence, like put some synchronization into it and just have things like we put your stuff live every Wednesday, whatever there is. And up until then, you will have to have a look at it and things that happen on a regular basis. And another thing is the input queue, the backlog. And what people usually do is they have things in the backlog. And I've seen things like well, let's define all of it, let's groom the backlog, and then we estimate the stuff, all of this, and then we ask the customer if he really wants it at this price and everything, um, and half of the stuff is never going to be done, and sitting on the shelf with lots of brain put into it. There's lots of knowledge already in those tickets. This is your inventory, you're working with people, you're working with ideas, and the closer you can get those ideas to the actual doing, like refine it right there, and then do it. This is why sprints work, because you don't lose so much. You just go ahead doing after you've talked about it, and this is less expensive. Well, yes, you have ideas. Put them in the backlog, all of them. No problem. Put them in there, but don't make them expensive there. They're going to lie around for a while. And then you refine them as soon as they need to be done. Another thing is um, something you... Who, who knows limit work in progress? Ever heard of it? Yeah? Yeah, this is actually what people do is, um, or what organizations do in order to improve flows and in order to have people concentrate on one thing instead of 12 at the same time, 
this, they put WIP limits. We have three developers, so we put a WIP limit of three in here. So no more than three tasks may be in here. And this is just an in-process regulation. You're regulating something that might be self-regulating at one point. And um, there's another thing. Uh, I'm, I, I draw it like this. You have a cake factory. Yeah, there are people who um, who bake the cakes and they are decorating it. And actually, in production, those are like palettes or something, batches that circulate. So they send a batch of 10 cakes over to the decorators, and they decorate it perfectly, and they send it back. And as long as they have batches to fill, they may work. And this is something you can use. Uh, the German word for batch is charge. By the way, this is your this is your whip limit. So actually, the whip limit you can use whip limits very efficiently to where the queues are, because then you regulate your process. This is where your bottlenecks are, and more than regulating the workers, you now are regulating the work. And what now? They cannot work. What the, are they doing? Well, they go over and help the decorators because they are sl uh, slower and they can't work because they are upstream. Well, what about T-shaped people? What about people that you cannot only use here, but maybe also, like, they can also do front-end and they might also do this or that. Not every time. They are more specialized in this area, but y in order to reduce queues, you can have T-shaped people that help you very efficiently. So, and the next thing people are very afraid of often is variability. People tend to make things in a way that they don't change so much, that uh, they can use the same idea over and over and over. And um, actually are afraid of variability. I've seen this many, many times. And uh, well, variability is neither good nor bad. The variability you have in queues, I would suggest to lower it. Um, but you could exploit certain economic possibilities. And I would just shortly show you something from the area of option pricing. So, um, stock markets, just very roughly. Actually, an option is you, you have a certain payoff and this is the price. And you have something that is called a strike price. And an option is now you can buy the option to buy a certain good like um, wheat or gold or whatever in the future at a certain price. So this is the strike price and you have, you have to invest some money. You have to buy that option. And as long as you are below that strike price, you uh, do not make profit. There's no payoff. And with every cent above the strike price, you are going to uh, have some payoff out of it. And now, th this is just very roughly what option pricing is about. And um, now you have a probability distribution. You know those, like... And you can have a low probability, like this area, and you have higher probabilities. And those low probabilities are like, have a, this area of expected payoff. So this is a small area that you might get something out of it. And the larger 
the distribution is, the more probable it is that you are going to make something out of it. And that's the thing. The more possibilities you have, and I mean, in what we do, you have lots of possibilities, but if you're al always doing the same old stuff, this is just very low variability. If you explore new things, if you take chances, you are more probable to win than you are to lose. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're a very clever investment banker, you take the risk. <laughs> no, I got the point. No. Well, in our case, it is more or less like we have a very rather unlimited downside. You can invest as much, you can sink as much money as you want into that feature. That's no problem. Um, you can limit that. You can say, well, let's stop at that point, whether we get something out of it or not. But And you have a rather limited upside. That's not absolutely unlimited. But still, you have a larger area of chances of getting something out of it. And what do we achieve now? What I uh, started with is flow which we all like. Um, actually, as I said, it is more or less the opposite of queues. If you don't have queues, you might have flow. And you, if you don't have large queues, you will have more flow. And um, how do we calculate flow? Flow is density multiplied by speed. Well, mathematically, it is, speed is kilometers per hour, density is vehicles per kilometer. Uh, if you take kilometers off the equation, you get vehicles per hour, which is flow. And um, this is very interesting now, because in you could say, okay, let's have a very high density at a very high speed. That's optimum, isn't it? So put things in and work as fast as you can. And that's optimum flow. No, it isn't. It's like on a highway, if you compare, if you set flow in relation to speed, what is happening? Exactly. The more speed I have, the less density I can have. Because then you're so prone of accidents, like 250, every car at a highway, that's going to be a mess. So this is density, actually. And density gets less when getting faster. And well, actually, the faster you are, as we know, the more flow you actually can have, theoretically. But this is your trade-off. And again, so this is speed. And if you multiply density with speed, you get, again, kind of a U-curve. And this is your flow. So again, you have an area of optimum flow somewhere in the middle, wherever that is, but surely not at very high speed and surely not at very low speed, but somewhere in the middle. And there's another factor to it, which is very interesting. If you look at this, if you're a bit faster than your optimum is, what happens if you get slower? And you get slower anyway, so you don't have to do anything to get slower. Well, you get slower, and your flow increases. So that's just an very, a very interesting phenomenon, and uh, very different at this side. You get just slower and slower. But the first time I told this, people were um, telling me, oh, wow, we, we always knew that people have to work faster. No, they don't have to. Do not tell them to work faster. That doesn't help. But optimizing flow means that you have to remove barriers and have to remove cues. 
and not to tell people, let's work faster, then we have better flow. Yeah, that was all I wanted to tell you. I hope it was a bit interesting for you. Thank you for listening, and uh, maybe there's space for some questions. I heard we don't have any talk right after it. Well, whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, all this is basically Kanban in theory. I mean, the only really interesting part is of really having numbers with it. Mm -hmm. So we say, okay, I put another developer in the project, means I, I increase speed, for example, or I put another working spot, whatever you, whatever you call it. What does it really mean in real figures? And having a model that really allows me to calculate those not for those two or three people project. There I, I can estimate it just by looking at the people. It's not, not the big issue, but for big projects, that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, especially this is an IT, is still an untackled problem. Because if, when you go to, to the bigger clients and to the bigger projects, then um, things like really uh, business value for features become the thing. I don't know I mean, if anybody ever worked with idle. I mean, it's, 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 it's terrible, but nevertheless, um, the idea that you say, okay, every, every feature has to have a business value, and this has, has, to be, has to be set at a certain point, and then you can measure actually uh, what, what um, arbitrary costs and what virtual costs that you were des uh, describing you uh, put against it. That would be, I wouldn't really say it would be all that useful, it would be, it would be useful in sales, I'll put it that way, mm -hmm. because in reality, uh, you never know the business value of a feature. And Unless it's really you can really put it into 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 a, into a technological process, did you encounter any reliable, interesting models in calculating those costs, not just roughly estimating them? Well, not. I, I've been looking for them. I've been watching videos over and over. Now yeah. I'm just trying to develop them myself because there's just so, yeah, so you gut gut feelings are still the best. Not I'm gut feelings, but rather. Wrong calculations, then no calculations. And being, I, I, I think the main thing is being aware of those trade-offs that you run into. That you don't optimize just one factor without knowing that you might influence another one. Yeah. If I find any, I'm going to let you know. Yeah. You had a question? Just the same. Yeah. Yeah. I've been looking for it over and over. Even the videos that are really great. I think as uh, many times just uh, the process of be becoming aware of the actual numbers, like wi while you are looking up different uh, parts of it when you sum it up and try to calculate it, that that is the whole point. Like uh, writing down a thought is more than just thinking a thought, mm -hmm. because uh, if you just guesstimate, you know, like. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, finding the numbers because uh, very often you will uh, just cheat, you know, because you have that pet project or. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like reading the book and knowing the theory just helped me to make things so much more efficient without any numbers behind it. So I think. Good. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>